15 years ago, somebody gave me a book called Loving the Church by Cardinal Schoenborn. Uh, spiritual exercises preached in the, in the presence of Pope John Paul II. A series of addresses given by Cardinal Schoenborn to the Pope on the subject of the church. And I love this book, Loving the Church, and I found it uh, inspiring, inspirational. Little did I think that I would ever be meeting the man, let alone having the privilege of interviewing him and having him at this conference. He's one of the most senior figures in the entire Roman Catholic Church. He's the man responsible for drafting this, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And uh, he's the uh, head of the Austrian Church, Catholic Church, uh, and has been a cardinal for, for many years. And uh, we just have been so thrilled to have him at this conference. He's been here throughout, um, and he's become a real friend. And, uh, and again, it, it's been so interesting to see people's responses to him as he's walked into a room and lit up the room with his love and his warmth and his presence. And uh, I hope it's not um, inappropriate to say that he's become a real friend. Would you give a warm welcome to Cardinal Schoenborn? We are so thrilled and honored to have you with us. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm so thrilled to be here. Really, it's amazing. Oh, thank it's you amazing. so much. What a privilege. What a privilege. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, let me start with a little bit of your background because it, it's so fascinating to me. You came from this very kind of aristocratic family, uh, all these sort of dukes and were born in a castle. And, but your family also very much uh, church people. Um, and I think, it, am I right in saying there, were, there have been eight bishops in your family and three cardinals? Yes. <laughs> And, yes. <laughs> and, and tell us about the one family where I think there were five brothers who were all bishops. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's not in the genetic code that we all become bishops. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's a fact uh, that uh, in the last 200 years, all those who entered the clergy became also bishops. Uh, I tried to escape, but I, I didn't, <laughs> didn't succeed. <laughs> So uh, well, uh, the, the great generation was, with, there, there were three generations of bishops, they did great things to, to the Catholic Church. The first in the six, in 17th century, he, he made the peace treaty of, uh, of uh, Westphalia the, after the 30, 30 years war. Uh, and he was a great friend of the, to the Protestants being a Catholic bishop, being the chancellor of the empire, uh, and, uh, and he tried to reconcile, to, to, to work on reconciliation. His nephew became bishop in Mainz, was chancellor of the empire. Um, he tried to keep the countries uh, out of the, the war conflicts, and as, as we say, under the bishop's uh, stab, how you say? Uh, it's peacefuler to live than under the secular rules. Is, I'm not sure that's always true. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and then came another, a third generation, and there were five bishops in one generation. And they were duke bishops. Just explain what a duke bishop means. They, they, had, they, had, they ruled the country as uh, well. Well, uh, as it was at that time in France, in Germany, uh, in the Roman, uh, Roman German Empire, most of the bishops were also secular rulers because the the diocese was also a secular state, and so they were all, uh, these were dukes of Franconi or uh, duke archbishop of uh, Trier or Mainz or, yes, they had to rule, the, they were secular rulers, but also church rulers. And the system, as you know, ended with the end of the Roman uh, German Empire in 18. 
and, uh, and it's good that it ends. <laughs> <laughs> now, your father was a, a very brave man, wasn't he? Because he was involved in uh, anti-Nazi resistance. Well, he, uh, my father was, was a painter, an artist, and uh, he, he really had profound opposition to the Nazi regime. He never became an officer in the German army. The aristocrats had to become officers normally, but he refused. And, and at the first occasion, he uh, deserted the German army and went to the British army. Uh, uh, yeah. So he, he came back to Germany uh, with the British army, and uh, I see on, uh, in my mother's home the photograph of my father in the British uniform. Yeah. And you then, then there was persecution from, from uh, another source and you had to flee? Well, uh, the drama, most people ignore uh, on the island, uh, the, the drama of um, 1945 uh, in Czechoslovakia when the entire German-speaking population, one-third of the population was driven out, was expulsed, the Czech have a beautiful word for that, exvitation, mm -hmm. they call it, not invitation, exvitation. Mm -hmm. So we have been exvited from, uh, Germ from our homeland, um, and uh, by the grace of God, we have been freed from all earthly goods. But we gained the most important, we gained freedom. Mm -hmm. And my cousins, who were rather on the Czech-speaking Czech side, one is bishop now in, in, in Czech Republic, they had to stay and they have lost also everything, uh, inclusive freedom. So I think we had the better part. Mm. Tell us about your journey of faith. M my, my family was... Uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, they were very exemplary Catholics because my grandfather divorced and married four times. My parents were... My father was never practicing. My, my mother was practicing, but uh, traditionally. Uh, and faith was... Religion was not a not a question at home, uh, rarely, rather intellectually, yeah, not, not, not practically. Uh, and when I was 13, my parents divorced, uh, and, um, and I discovered faith at the age of 11, personally, and it became really a personal relation to Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I began, began to to practice regularly and to become an altar boy mm -hmm. and, and uh, to be close to the parish. And I remember when I was 13, 14, so uh, uh, pu pubertate mm -hmm. yeah, age, I said to my mother, my home place is the parish. Mm -hmm. and, and I got my priestly vocation very early mm -hmm. uh, at the age of 11. And I remember very well that moment when I felt the first time that call to priesthood. Uh, and, and astonishingly, it remained through, through all these years. And at my uh, uh, serious age of 18, uh, I became a Dominican. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my mother thought that I'm a little bit too young for that. Um, I said, I, I know this is my place, and I became a Dominican. And you studied a great, I mean, you, you're fluent in six languages, and you've studied, and you have doctorates. Uh, just if you add Greek and Latin, then it's a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was feeling bad anyway. <laughs> Amazing. But you no. know, my predecessor, Cardinal Koenig, famous Cardinal Koenig, uh, who was a, was a genius in languages, um, I asked him one day, uh, Your Eminence, how many languages do you really speak? And he, he gave the answer, 
difficult were only the first ten. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And, uh, and then you did the, your doctorate. Um, just talk a little bit about your studies. And the... uh, I, I began uh, my studies with the Dominicans in Germany, and very soon there came the big crisis. The big crisis in the Catholic Church, you, you know, uh, from the mid-60s on, uh, there was a tremendous crisis. Uh, 80,000 priests have left priesthood mm. in the, the years between 65 and 75. Mm. It's, an, it's a drama, it's an enormous drama. And I was very young, I was shaken by, by the crisis. Uh, we were taught Bultmann, you know, yeah. who is yeah. Bultmann? Yes, uh, that's this uh, very liberal, critical German Protestant exegesis. And we lost ground. Mm. I, uh, I'm not in the confessional here, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but I, I, must, I must say, uh, I stopped prayer for one year being in a monastery. Mm. Because we were taught Prayer doesn't mean anything, so uh, mm. I stopped praying. Mm. And after that year, I was near to, to leave uh, religious life and the way to priesthood. And, and I remember the day and the, the hour and the place where the Lord catched me back. Mm. Uh, mm. Unforgettable, mm. unforgettable. Yeah. Mm. Amazing grace, yeah. But then, then uh, uh, we had this tremendous experience of, of a collapse in theology, in religious life, in church life. And it was, again, a tremendous and amazing grace. I met in 67, I was 22 years old, uh, I met an Orthodox monk who had participated at Vatican II uh, as an observer and one evening uh, unforgettable he spoke to a little group of young Dominicans about the church fathers hmm. and about his spiritual father, his starets and it, it, was, it was a blow up it was, an, it was a, an, an, a disc, disclosure it, for us, for me uh, and we started studying the church fathers. And that saved us. Mm. That saved us. I discovered the, the love for the church fathers, for the, the, the as St. Uh, Jerome says, when the earth was still warm from the blood of Christ. Yeah. This period of the beginnings of the church. Mm. Uh, and so I, 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 I came to theology and later I became a professor. Uh, in, in Switzerland. And I had a great privilege to be helped by some great theologians. Hans Urs von Balthasar, mm. uh, who invited me to meet him, uh, me as a young theologian, I, I was unknown, and, and, and he encouraged me a lot. Mm. Such a great man, be so simple and humble to, to help this young man. Uh, uh, Henry Chadwick in Oxford, mm. uh, he gave me such encouragement. Mm. Uh, and then Joseph Ratzinger, mm. who became my teacher. And since then, I know him for 42 years now. And uh, in confession, I can say the first thing he said to me after the election in 2005, uh, when he was elected Pope, he said, let us keep our friendship. Mm. Uh, it's really a great privilege to have known him and to have worked with him with, for many years. The Catechism of the Catholic Church would not exist if Cardinal Ratzinger would not have been the head of our drafting committee, the head of this commission. He is an amazing man and it's a great, great privilege to have had him as teacher. Mm. And although he was the head of that, every sentence in this went through you, didn't it? There was not a single sentence that you weren't responsible for drafting. Yes, but I was the pen in many pages. <laughs> yeah.
Uh, but, but, but let, let's go back to the, to the previous book because uh, the, the book that I loved so much, Loving the Church, was a series of talks that you gave to Pope John Paul II. Tell us about him and your relationship with him because by then you were, you were a cardinal uh, and you were the Not head of... Not yet. You were, I was Archbishop of Vienna and then afterwards appointed cardinal. Uh, just, just tell us about <coughs> um, Pope John Paul II. Uh, well, I have a personal witness after preaching this retreat to him uh, and to his staff, uh, he, he offered me this cross and it was a cross he personally had uh, worn for many years. Mm. So it is a personal cross of his mm. and you can imagine that uh, it's very dear to me. What, what was he like as a person? Uh, what impressed me most with him, he was a man of prayer mm. and I had had many occasions to stay with him in the chapel. Uh, one evening alone with him after dinner, and I never forget this impression of a man who is really, uh, I said always, he's a rock of prayer. Mm. He, when, when he entered prayer, you had the impression he was really uh, with Jesus in, in, the, in the Father's womb. Yeah, uh, that, that was this, this deep, deep connectedness uh, that impressed us so much. I think that was the, 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 the deep secret of his life. Mm. And then, of course, your friendship with Pope Benedict for many years. What about Pope Francis? Pope Francis is, is just a joy. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm not allowed to, uh, to tell you the secrets of, of the conclave, but, but uh, I can tell you something for certain. Uh, the evening of the 12th of March, uh, when the conclave began, I am quite sure none of us knew that the next evening we will have Pope Francis mm. as successor of Peter. It was, it, it was a tremendous experience of the Holy Spirit. Mm. We have been driven in <laughs> such a... We have been driven by the Holy Spirit to this man. He was sitting in, in the, the last corner of the Sixtine Chapel. Yeah. This man, he is the chosen one. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, I had received at least two strong signs. The one I can tell, the other was in the conclave I can't speak <laughs> about. Uh, but real signs of the Lord giving me indication he is the one. A, a couple of friends I met after the introduction mass to the conclave, the so-called mass uh, uh, pro eligendo pontifice for the election of the Pope. I met this couple, uh, uh, they are from Latin America working in the Vatican. And I met him outside the, the, the basilica and, and asked, you have the Holy Spirit. Uh, can, can you give me advice for, for the conclave that will start in a few hours? And she whis whispered in my ear, Bergoglio. <laughs> and it, it hit me really. If these people say Bergoglio, that's an indication of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. and, they, and I'm sure that many of us have received similar signs mm. during the conclave. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible to have this election so soon and so rapidly. Mm. How well do you know him? I met him first time in 96 in, uh, uh, in, in Buenos Aires uh, with a com community I, I, I am responsible of, uh, a community of, of brothers and sisters, so-called community of the Lamb, uh, the Lamb, and they have a community 
in Rio de Janeiro and in the poorest area around Rio de Janeiro. And uh, the then auxiliary bishop, uh, Bergo Jorge Bergoglio, was from the beginning very deep friend with this community. And so I had often echoes from them, uh, you know, the sisters, uh, <laughs> give news, give news, yeah. So they gave, I often received news about, about him when he became Archbishop and Cardinal and how close he was. And the first audience he gave after his election was to my community. Mm. Uh, he said to me, uh, the, the second day after the election, he said to me, I want to meet the community of the Lamb. We must arrange a meeting. Uh, and, and the same day in the afternoon, he met them. It was so joyful. Uh, and he gave the indication, hold on on poverty, the love to the poor. Hold on on prayer and liturgy. And continue to hike. Uh, and he made this sign because they tried to drive, to, to, to move by hiking. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so, hitchhiking, you say? <laughs> hitchhiking. Uh, hitchhiking, <laughs> yeah. Uh, car hiking. Uh, but he has given us so many signs in, the, in these two months uh, that, uh, you know, there's a, a strange similarity with your Archbishop Justin. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, I hope so much that they will meet soon, mm, uh, yes. because uh, I don't know about uh, how the secrets of the conclave in Lambert <laughs> Palace works, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but uh, it looks like a little miracle that he became the Archbishop, yes. doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think the Lord has given us a great sign mm. through these two elections uh, and other signs. And you know what I have deeply in my heart, uh, what the Lord is telling us and what I feel in, 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 in what, is, what is going on here, what he's doing here. Uh, it is as if he would say to the world, come home. I, wait for you. Mm. 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 And just on the, how, how, how can, what form, how can unity progress? I think what, what he said, uh, Archbishop Justin said yesterday, w was so, so good. I mean, there's, there's no other way than uh, come together in the love of Jesus. Mm. That is the way of unity. Mm. And what, from my early priesthood on, when the first time I met uh, evangelicals, free churches, uh, uh, what, what brought me to them was to feel the deep love for Jesus, mm. which often uh, I find more vibrant, more and more expressed uh, in in other Christian communities than in in my own. Uh, I believe profoundly that that there is great love for Christ, mm. uh, but it's it's that what we have to learn from each other. I I told you uh, on Sunday night what Pope Benedict. His last word in our meeting, we meet every year since 33 years with his former doctrines. He is the most faithful uh, doctor father to his uh, pupils I, I know in the academic world. Every summer we meet for an academic meeting and a friendship meeting. And when he became Pope, he said, well, uh, we had already agreed the meeting in Bavaria for the summer, but then he became Pope. And he said, well, come to Castel Gandolfo mm. uh, in my summer residence. Mm. And so we had eight meetings with him in Castel Gandolfo. And the last was on ecumenism between the Lutherans 
and the Catholics, and also the Anglican and the Catholic. Mm -hmm. And there's always invited a guest, uh, Bishop Lose, the Lutheran Bishop Emeritus Bishop, uh, was our guest, guest speaker, and at the end of the day, we were all fairly depressed <laughs> because the results of the official ecumenical dialogue is not very enthusiastic. Uh, we have produced many papers, but it, it seems stuck a little bit. It seems, uh, and at the end, his very last word was of Pope Benedict. He said, well, listen, summarizing the discussion of the day, do, do we not expect in a too worldly way uh, ecumenical, uh, ecumenical progress? We want to account results and put them in, the, in our account book. Yeah. Uh, progress in ecumenism. But then he said, is that really the way the Lord teaches us to, how to go to unity? And he said, isn't the deepest purpose of ecumenical, the ecumenical movement that we listen to each other mm. and that we learn from each other how to follow better Christ? Mm -hmm. I found it so relieving. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And that's what we are living here. And um, you're part of the Pontifical Council for the New Evangelization. Just, just tell us a little bit about this vision for the new evangelization and how we can work together. And uh, well, I'm so happy to be here. And, and uh, you know, uh, what I missed in the Synod, uh, this is off the record. <laughs> <laughs> it won't go any further than us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, the first day of the Synod, uh, Mark and uh, Francine are here, the, uh, of the Alpha team, yeah. They were at the Synod representing Alpha. They were allowed to speak full four minutes. Mm. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, no, uh, it was beautiful. It's, it's just amazing to be 300 bishops from all over the world together for three weeks with a great group of lay people, uh, with a great group of uh, other churches. Uh, and it was a good experience. But nevertheless, what was lacking at what I find here, uh, the first day I, I asked to speak and I, I, I said, we are all the bishops, yeah, we believe in the Catholic Church, we are successors of the apostles. The apostles were sent by the Lord to preach the gospel. So we are sent to preach the gospel. What? is our personal experience in preaching the gospel. Of course, we preach every Sunday. I preach every day. Poor sisters have to listen every day <laughs> to my homily. Uh, I, I celebrate, if any possible, every day Holy Eucharist because it's really the nourishment of, of my life. But uh, the direct preaching of the gospel, the, the, the charisma, the... the, the the mission, the evangelization, uh, that's not preaching in the church on Sunday. That's also, it's good, yeah? But what is our mission experience, our experience of evangelization? Uh, please, I ask the, the bishops' conference, please let us speak about our personal experience. Mm -hmm. And what happened is everybody spoke about what we do in our diocese what our team does what our uh, uh, and that we have established a commission for new evangelization uh, and the uh, the etiquette of uh, of evangelization is put on everything first communion preparation confirmation preparation everything is evangelization but to reach out as pope francis tells us every day 
reach out, go to the, to the margin of the society. What is our experience as bishops? Mm. And I was really disappointed that we, we have too much fear to speak about our vulnerability. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Our vulnerability. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, in, when I speak about the new evangelization, the, the best success I have always when I tell stories about how I failed to do evangelization in certain situations. Mm. Everybody recognizes, or many recognize themselves in such situations. When I really wept uh, and said to the Lord, Lord, you have sent me as an apostle, as a missionary. And I miss such a, such a chance to announce your name. What, what a poor guy I am. Uh, uh, that helps much more for uh, evangelization than to come with the success and, and great numbers of uh, converts. Uh, to, to speak about our failures in evangelization. We didn't do that during the synod and I regret. And where do you see the way forward now? What, how, how can we progress this? I see... Uh, well, what, what, what I see here is... is uh, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. Uh, the Lord is, is, is moving us, uh, calling us, uh, and bringing us together in, in, in an unexpected way. Uh, and uh, I think f what is for me the, 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 the most important in, in evangelization is that we must feel the longing of Jesus for the souls. Mm -hmm. his, his longing for us if we have not in us the sense that he is wanting our salvation. Uh, he wants us to be his friends. If, if we have not in us uh, the, this, this burning evidence that the Lord desires to have friends and new friends and that we are called like Andrew did with Peter, he brought him to Jesus. Yeah? then I think uh, we have missed the point. Yeah. I think that's your favorite verse in the Bible, isn't it? John 15. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, then Jesus says, I've called yeah, you friends. I call, that's my, my episcopal device, is uh, I called you friends. Yeah. Yeah. And I know one of the groups that you've been uh, really working with, and I had the privilege of going to speak at the Loretto community. And I think we've got a, maybe a picture of the, some of them uh, coming up, uh, amazing <laughs> gathering of young people, thousands and thousands of young people who gather. Pete Gregg is going to speak um, yes. to 5,000 of them. Thank all. you, Pete, that you go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Thousands of them gathering for Pentecost. And there's amazing movement. I mean, it's, it struck me as, as we have a movement here like Soul Survivor, thousands of young people gathering. And this was so like that in terms of the age of the people and the... Um, uh, and I, and I know speaking to the leaders of that, Georg and uh, that... Thank you, uh, Nikki and Peter, that you uh, came to, to Austria to meet them. They were so thrilled. Thank you. Oh, yeah. thank, well, we loved it. It was an it was absolute privilege. But they tell me that you have been very much a part of that and encouraging them right from the start many years ago. Yes, and I, I even uh, committed a grave sin. I... I uh, encourage them to hire a man from youth with a mission <laughs> to train them. <laughs> uh, Bruce Cluet, who is a dear friend for many years, and he's, he's, he's such an evangelization. Uh, he's really a man full of of the spirit and, and he trained them in discipleship uh, and that was a good move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
finally, is there anything that you would li like? Uh, there are uh, five and a half thousand people here. There are thousands more watching this online, and I know uh, everyone's appreciated your presence. Is there anything, any message you have to encourage um, everyone here? Yes, I, I, I want to to say one thing. I, I was so impressed what you said yesterday about your father and what uh, Archbishop Justin told about his father. Mm. You have both Jewish, German Jewish fathers. And I, I think the deepest wound uh, in the body of Christ, in the unique body of Christ, is the wound between Israel and the Gentiles. Mm. And uh, uh, in, your, in your body, in, in your life, and in Archbishop Justin's life, and a little bit also in my own you life. Have, you have Jewish blood in your yes. life. Uh, I think we are called to, to ask the Lord to heal this deepest wound when it is his time. But uh, Pope Benedict, in this famous uh, prayer for Good Friday, which was so badly received, but which is so profound, he said, and he wrote it himself, this prayer, he said, this, this intense prayer that the time of the Gentiles may be accomplished, that the mission to the Gentiles may be accomplished so that the fullness of Israel may rejoin full salvation. Uh, and that's what, what we are doing, what you are doing with Alpha, with evangelization, is the deepest desire of the Lord, that the time of the Gentiles may be accomplished whenever he alone knows, the Father alone knows when this will be accomplished. Uh, but uh, it is Jesus' great desire. And there is one one element which is hard to accept but saving if accepted that it is only through the cross that this can be achieved mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Cardinal Schoenborn thank you so much Come and pray for us. I think um, there's a general desire from everyone here that you'll come and pray for us. We need your prayers. Let's stay standing okay, together. <laughs> Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your amazing grace. The grace of your eternal love, the grace of your Holy Spirit you have put out on your church. Thank you, Lord, for your prayer that they may be one as you and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. Jesus, we ask you, Break the walls that separate us. Mm. Build the bridges between us. 
over, let us help us to overcome the fears of meeting us, reaching out together for your glory, for your gospel, for your word, your life. So many people in the world are longing to know you, ignore you, but you want them to know you and the Father in the Holy Spirit. So we thank you, Lord, for this great opportunity you have given us in this assembly. We thank you. Lord, I thank you for all these young people I've seen here working behind the stage, working all around in their pink... Uh, <laughs> no. what, a, what a joy to see their commitment. Mm -hmm. What a hope for the church, mm -hmm. for the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, for all the generosity you put into the hearts and the ways of faith you lead them. So I ask you, Lord, to bless the whole assembly and all those who are participants through uh, live stream mm. and other means. Mm. May Almighty God bless us, the Father and the Son mm. and the Holy Spirit. Mm. Amen. Amen. Amen.